what I love about, uh, about how the Bible talks about this is that we don't have to do anything for God to love us. That it's not about what we've accomplished. It's not about our resume. That we get that love for free. And if I don't have to work to be loved, then all else is secondary, right? And so when I think about how Christ loves me, he didn't ask me to do anything for it. And so it means I don't have to do anything to be loved. And if, and if being loved and being understood and being created, nothing else really matters after that. And I, and I um, you know, the Bible talks a lot about purpose. And when I study it as a psychologist, the Bible talks about it uh, as well. And, you know, we're, we're given gifts and talent and purpose. And we're also equipped to do the things that we're called to do. And God's, the Bible says that God doesn't leave us alone, that he will be with us. He will hold us upright in his righteous right hand, it says in, in Isaiah 41, that he won't leave us. And if I'm going to be loved and never left and upheld by a righteous right hand, what else matters? And so that's what it means to me. I spend a lot of time thinking about purpose as, as, as adolescents and young adults find their place in the world. But then I'm reminded that we were designed and we were given gifts and talents and we were given a purpose and no one asked us to do anything to belong. And that's how it kind of it gets interwoven for me. It's just remembering just, you know, we are beautifully and wonderfully made. And, you know, I look at all the human beings that I love to look. I love adolescents and all the ways in which they're, they're quirky and funny and insecure and figuring themselves out. And they all want to be different, and so they're different in the same way. So they all wear the same clothes because they think they're all being different, right? <laughs> and, you know, but each of them has a spark inside of them. And... It gives me deep joy to try to capture that spark and fan it into a flame. It says in Proverbs that the purpose of one's heart is a deep well, and one with insight can draw it out. And so I'm constantly looking for the person that can bring insight. We've talked about mentors. We've talked about people who will shake us into <laughs> and, and in my work, you know, we, with uh, young adults, we, we talk about mentorship, and we have kind of a mentorship model, and, and we've talked about one of the types, which is mirrors, which is someone who will affirm who you are. We hold up a mirror to you and affirm and remind you when you doubt. And the second one is, is, is windows. You need a mentor who's a window. And the window is the it, mentor is the one that stands beside you and looks out on the horizon and helps you imagine how your gifts and talents can be used in the world. And what often happens to, in college, at least with the college students that we study, is that they get all excited when they came in. They, wrote, they get admitted. They have the imposter syndrome about being admitted. But they, can't, they got admitted with some ideas. And then something happens along the way, and they've, they've lost their way, and they end up doing a pre-professional program by default. So I don't know what else to do, so I'm going to do pre-law. I don't know what else I'm going to do, so I'm going to do med school. I don't know what else I'm going to do. I'm going to try to get into business school. And all of those paths are perfectly fine, except if you're saying, I don't know what else to do. And it becomes a default. And they talk about, and the people in our research talk about it as the default path. And so the window mentor will keep you off the default path and squarely in your purpose. And then the third mentor type is guiding lights. And these are the people that tell you the way you should go. They tell you how to reach your dreams. How, after they've helped you cultivate them, someone's helped you cultivate them, you need a guiding light that's going to get you off of, the, off of square one when imposter syndrome is high and push you into, into action and out of inaction. And so that's how faith, it's deeply embedded in how I think about purpose and life and my own experience with imposter syndrome.